to me, the way that I think about mental health is it's just like physical health. I really, I think, shifted in the way that I think about mental health throughout my career. And the way that I think about it now is it is just an aspect of your overall health. So you have your physical health, your bodily health, you have your dental health, you have your mental health. Like this is just part of who you are as a whole person. And it's really important to think about that. You know, just like you would brush your teeth and floss your teeth to take care of your dental health, you should be thinking about what are you doing on a daily basis to take care of your mental health. We are Gold Ivy, a health company dedicated to simplifying health and wellness. The industry is lacking the honest experience and grit required to overcome the struggle. And we're here to fill that gap. You decide what works for your daily life and how to transform our lessons into your gold. Join us on the fearless pursuit of self-discovery and growth. This is Ivy Unleashed, a Gold Ivy production. Welcome back. You guys are listening to Ivy Unleashed here with Brooke and Andrea. And from the bottom of our hearts, we are so grateful you guys are joining us. We yes. have an incredible show for you guys today. Yes, we really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to us. And we hope that when you are tuning in and taking out that time of your day, which is precious, that you're getting something out of it, mm-hmm. that our insight is helpful and that our guest insight is helpful. And this month is huge. We are so excited because May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And for the entire month of May, you can expect every Monday that we have another episode that is going to highlight another area of mental health. Yeah. And you know, when you think of health, a lot of times we just think about physical and that's not true. Our health is made up of physical and mental and our mental health is just as important as physical. So before we dive in, we want to make it known that the information you hear today should not be taken as medical advice. The content here is for informational purposes only. And because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Yes. So kicking off Mental Health Awareness Month, we wanted to bring in our first ever psychologist, Dr. Brittany Matthews. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, you guys. I'm so grateful that you've asked me to be a part of it. Yes, we are so excited because it's just crucial that we address mental health. And Mm -hmm. so we're so happy that you're here. And I don't know if the world knows, but you are also my best friend. And so I'm just happy to be in your presence anytime. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of questions for you. And uh, we know you personally. So can you tell our listeners about your professional life? Sure. I am trained as a child and adolescent clinical psychologist. So I have my doctorate in clinical psychology, which I got from Kent State University in Ohio. And I did my pre and postdoctoral training at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis. So I was lucky enough to be there in the same state as you for a few years. And now I'm located in the Milwaukee area. And uh, my clinical and research interests really focus on uh, depression, anxiety, trauma, and disruptive behavior in youth, so children, adolescents and early adulthood. And I have a special passion for bringing mental health care to traditionally underserved communities. I love talking about mental health and I'm really excited to be here with you guys today to talk more about it. Yeah, and we, of course, love talking about it and are so interested in it. And for those who, this might be a new topic to kind of dive into, Brett, I'd love for you to touch on why mental health is important to acknowledge and invest in. Yeah, I think that's such uh, an important and wonderful question. And I think what helps me to answer this question is to really think about the definition of mental health. I think there can be a lot of stigma around mental health or misconceptions about what it is. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page here, I wanted to bring it back to the definition of mental health. So the CDC and the World Health Organization define mental health as our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. And mental health affects the way that we think, the way that we feel, and the way that we act. And it impacts our everyday relationships, how well we're functioning, and uh, our ability to make healthy choices and decisions for ourselves. 
So if we think about that definition, that pretty much hits every area of every person's life on an almost minute by minute basis. So our mental health impacts everything that we do. And that's why it's so important to be aware of it, to acknowledge its importance and to address it if things are not going well. And if things are going well, to continue to engage in preventive measures to keep yourself mentally healthy. The other thing I think that's important to talk about when answering this question is the prevalence of mental health disorders. So in a one-year period, uh, the prevalence of mental health disorders for the adult population in America is about 20%. So at any given time in a year period, about 20% of Americans meet diagnostic criteria for a mental health disorder. That's pretty prevalent, right? If you think about that percentage of the population, this is something that's affecting a lot of people. And there are a lot more people who are experiencing mental health difficulties who may not meet full criteria for a disorder. So just in kind of psychology lingo, you have to meet all of the criteria in order to be diagnosed with a disorder. But there's a lot of people who are experiencing some of the symptoms but continuing to function really well or continuing to be able to kind of get by with what they're doing in their everyday life. So they may not meet the criteria for that disorder, but they're still experiencing a lot of symptoms. So very prevalent. So it's something that, you know, permeates all of our lives every day, and it's a prevalent problem. And so that's why I think it's super important to acknowledge this and to talk about it and for people to be really addressing it. I'm curious, what are some of those symptoms? In terms of mild symptoms that might be happening, things to look out for are changes in mood. So if you're feeling more sad or down, than typical. Irritability is also something to look out for. People don't often think about that as being a symptom of problems with mental health, but that is a symptom of depression. It can be a symptom of anxiety. So really looking out for irritability within yourself if you're snapping at people or just getting uh, more annoyed easily. Changes in sleep patterns, having more difficulty sleeping or wanting to sleep more than usual. Changes in appetite, either decreased or increased. So these are some of the mild symptoms to kind of watch out for. There are more severe symptoms to think about as well. So if you've noticed a change in your mood that is lasting, you know, most of the day, nearly every day for at least two weeks, that's more of a severe symptom. And you should really think about seeking mental health at that point. There's a lot of anxiety going on that's really debilitating. You know, it's interfering with your ability to get what you need to get done each day. And um, that's something to watch out for. On the more severe side, too, if there are like significant problems with sleep, so insomnia where you're just not sleeping at all or excessive sleeping, you know, sleeping in, taking naps throughout the day, um, just sleeping more than you're awake, those types of things. Difficulty concentrating or a loss of interest and pleasure in things you normally do. Like if all of a sudden you just have no motivation for things, you, you just don't want to do things that you previously really enjoyed, that can be a, a red flag. And then, of course, anything that's interfering with your ability to do the things that you normally do on a daily basis. So if you're struggling to get out of bed, if you're not able to concentrate at work and your productivity is starting to um, decrease, anything like that that's really, um, you're not able to function at the same level before, that should be an indication to you that there may be something going on with your mental health. And lastly, but very importantly, any thoughts of self-harm are a severe symptom and should be taken very seriously. And so when I talk about mild symptoms, you know, I think these are things that we may all experience at certain times, depending on what stressors we have going on in our lives or things that we're dealing with. You know, there are times where we're going to have some difficulties with mental health. And that doesn't necessarily always mean that you need to seek out mental health professional help. So, you know, you guys talk a lot on this podcast about self-care, and that's really where if you notice those things, you want to step up your self-care efforts. So really thinking about taking care of yourself on a daily basis and ensuring that you are being mindful of taking care of yourself so that your needs are getting met, and hopefully that will alleviate some of those symptoms. And then for the more severe symptoms, then you may want to consider seeking out mental health, professional help. So for someone who's listening to this and a lot of those symptoms are something that they're experiencing, what are some actionable steps that they can take, you know, I'm thinking of my experience and when I was living alone, the beginning of COVID and in a, in a dark place because my health wasn't there and I was just struggling and getting out of bed was so hard. 
and, you know, to think of taking care of myself, it just seemed like so much work. So wondering Mm -hmm. if you have any actionable steps, I wouldn't say simple steps, but little nuggets that people don't seem so overwhelming for people to get started. So I'll kind of walk through some of my basic self-care items, which can really help. I also think like if it's at the point where you're, you know, a person is struggling so much with their motivation just to like get out of bed or like can't even, you know, set like a daily goal and accomplish that goal, then there is a lot of help out there. And then people really need support sometimes when it, it gets to that point. And so it's really important to seek professional help at that point. I think in terms of actionable steps that we all can take as preventive measures or if our mental health is um, suffering at some point in time, are getting back to the basics of general um, healthy habits, which you guys talk about all the time on this podcast. So people don't often think about this with mental health, but just taking care of your body is super important. You know, your brain takes, you know, controls everything that we do. And is a, the brain health is so important for mental health, right? So thinking about sleep, eating, and exercise. So making sure that you're getting an adequate amount of sleep for yourself and that you're on a regular sleep pattern, so kind of going to bed at the same time, waking up at the same time if possible. Adequate nutrition, making sure you get enough water each day, that you're eating regularly scheduled meals and trying to eat foods that are nutritious for your body. So give your body the fuel that it needs in order to function well. And then exercise, um, physical activity in whatever form you enjoy that or that you can get that is really important as well because when you are physically active, that helps your mental health as well. So just kind of always getting back to those basics of those healthy those healthy habits. Some other things that can be very helpful for mental health are scheduling pleasant activities into your everyday. So our schedules can be really hectic and a lot of times we're doing things throughout our day that have just become monotonous or maybe not even things that we enjoy. So it's really important to schedule in things that uh, you do enjoy that allow you to feel joy, to feel, you know, to have a little bit of fun, to experience some happiness. And the reason it's important to schedule that in is because if we don't schedule it in, it may not happen. Right. And because I think you guys have talked about this before on your podcast, but with our brains, we have this negativity bias. So they're always kind of, looking out for the negative and it can really take over. And then especially when you're struggling with depression or anxiety, the majority of your day may be spent where your brain is just kind of churning on these, these negative thoughts, which produce negative emotions and the positive emotions occur much less often. And so it's really important to schedule those pleasant activities to allow yourself the opportunity to experience positive emotions, which then can help you get out of that rut of that bad or low mood or anxiety or irritability, whatever it is you may be experiencing. The last thing I want to mention is social contact. And I know that's hard right now with COVID um, and social isolation, but social contact, social support is so key for mental health, whether that is having somebody that you really trust and can talk to and spend time with that really close personal relationship Or if it's just, you know, getting out of your your apartment or your home to go sit in a coffee shop where you are around other people, just that social setting can be very important. Isolation has really negative impact on our mental health. As humans, we are social creatures. And so when we're isolated, that can be really, really difficult. So increasing social contact, increasing social support is really important in terms of what we can do to care for our mental health. You know, I think about people that when... Like when I've been in a low spot in my life, I don't want to be a burden to other people. After I've had kids and my hormones are a little uneven or unstable and I just feel so off. I mean, I've had this experience with you where like I'm with my closest friends and I just feel like I don't even know why they want to hang around me because I'm so not myself. I feel so off. So I feel like sometimes when we know we need that social support. Or we know we need our friends. We don't want to burden them, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think that's so important to address and think about like, would you want your friends or closest family members to not come to you when they're that low? No, you would want them to tell you. And so I just want to remind all of our listeners, if you feel like you're irritable or you're a burden 
or you're just a downer that you're not, you know, you have people in your life that love you and tell someone it's making me emotional, but we've all had people in our life. Like my hometown, there's like a very large number of people that are committing suicide over the past decade and it's out of control. And I just want to say to everyone, like, if you're feeling that low, you need to tell your people Mm -hmm. because they want to help you. You are not a burden. You know, when you're in such a low state, it seems so hard to ask for help. And when you're not in a low state, you're like, just talk to someone. But it's hard. So Mm -hmm. for someone who is in that place, what what do you recommend? For somebody who's in that place, I can't emphasize enough to talk to someone, to talk to anyone, to talk to a friend, a family member. Um, There are professional resources available. There are crisis lines. There's a suicide prevention lifeline, and there's also a crisis text line that's available nationwide, and we'll include those in um, the notes from this episode. So those are professional resources that you can reach out to if you don't feel comfortable talking about those types of thoughts, um, thoughts of self-harm or suicidal thoughts with somebody that you know. But it is so important to talk with somebody because what you were just saying, Andrea, you know, when you've been in that place where you're just kind of like feeling like, you know, you're down, you don't want to like burden other people or you feel like you're, you know, um, kind of a downer to be around. That is your own brain thinking that way. And that's kind of that negativity bias coming in, right? Or a cognitive distortion is what we call that within the field of psychology. And as your friend who hung out with you at that point in time, I can tell you, like, I would have wanted nothing more than for you to talk with me about those things. And I wanted nothing more than to be with you and to spend time with you. And that is why it's so important for people who are in that place to talk with other people, because your brain is kind of playing tricks on you a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, It's got that bias, it's got that distortion. And so it's really important to talk with somebody else about that. So you can kind of get it out there. Check that thought, you know, say if you really think that nobody wants to be around you or if people don't want you around anymore, you know, check it out with somebody. Be like, hey, I'm thinking that, you know, is that accurate? Do you not want me to be around? And then people can, you know, give you some honest feedback that know that they do care about you. They want you around. And um, if you talk to somebody, they can kind of help you get connected if you need to with professional resources. You know, I, I can't say enough how important it is to talk about suicide. Suicide is the second leading cause of death in people um, under the age of 35. And so it's really, really important that we do something about this. The other thing that's really difficult right now is over the past decade, there has been a steady increase in the suicide rate in our country. It's a very big problem, and we need to be doing more to address it. So we need to start talking about it more. If you are experiencing that yourself, you need to reach out for help. There are excellent strategies and tools to help with suicidal thoughts and to treat underlying problems that may be there, like depression or anxiety or other um, mental illnesses. And if you are concerned about somebody else, you know, it's really important that you reach out to them to ask them, you know, how they're doing and to, to talk about it with them. So what are the best ways to support someone who is suffering with their mental health? So I think it's important to start by talking with them and being with them. So to open up a conversation and to ask them how they're doing and to go beyond just the like, hey, how are you doing today type of question where you get the I'm fine response, but to, to go a little bit deeper and to say, you know, I really care about you. How are you really doing? You know, leave it open-ended. Ask an open-ended question like that so then the person can really answer and give you a more true response to that question. If you're worried about how that question may be received by the other person or it may be sensitive, um, I think always starting to with like how you feel about that person. So, you know, saying, I really care about you. I love you. You're one of the most important people in my life. That's why I'm so concerned. I want to know how you're doing. And if you've seen things that are concerning to you about somebody else, you can say that. You know, you can say, like, I've noticed you're really irritable lately. And I'm wondering, you know, what's going on with that? Or I have noticed that you, you know, have dropped the ball a couple of times with hanging out 
or getting to work on time or whatever it is that you're seeing that's concerning you about that person's behavior. Or it could be, you know, sometimes people make these offhanded remarks about their own life or death or make jokes about suicide. And so that can be an opportunity to, to say like, hey, you mentioned this a couple of times and you know, you said it jokingly, but I really care about you and I take that seriously and I want to know, like, how are you doing and have you had those types of thoughts? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? So whether, you know, you're hoping to just check in with somebody and talk about how they're generally doing with their mental health is one type of conversation. And if you are really concerned about their safety or if you're concerned about them having self-harm thoughts or if they may be suicidal, it's really important to ask direct questions regarding suicidality. Um, and I know this topic can be really hard for people, especially if you're not used to doing this on a daily basis. This is something that I, when I, in my profession and in my work, I ask just about every time I have a session with somebody and just about to every person that I meet with. So it's something that I'm really comfortable with, but I realize that most people don't talk about this in their life ever. And so it can be really difficult. But I think what's really important to know is that when you ask directly, if you say to somebody, you know, are you thinking about self-harm? Are you thinking about killing yourself? That allows the opportunity for that person to be really honest with you, to actually give you a direct response to that question. And I know there is some concern that if you bring up that topic or if you ask that question, it could you know, influence somebody to hurt themselves. And the research is actually the opposite. So what the research shows is that if you bring this up with somebody who is at risk, if you ask that question directly, it's actually like more likely to reduce that person's risk than to push them in that direction. So it's really important to ask. And then if they say, yeah, you know, I have been having thoughts of self-harm, that's really heavy and that can be really hard to hold. I think one thing that can be helpful to know for people that I think the general population doesn't necessarily know is that having thoughts of self-harm and having thoughts of suicide is actually quite common. A lot of people have those thoughts and never act on it. So that can be helpful for people just to know that that does occur more often than people talk about. Also, if people do just, if, if someone that you love discloses that they're having thoughts of suicide, and then it gives you an opportunity to ask a little bit more and to help be that person who could prevent something from happening. So you might ask a question of, you know, what are you thinking about? Just a really open-ended question like that to get more information about what they are thinking about. You can ask specifically, you know, have you thought about how you would hurt yourself or have you thought about when you might do this? Asking those open-ended questions that are specific about a plan is really important because that'll give you some information that may be helpful. Like if they say that, you know, they explain to you exactly how they plan to do it and when, you know that that's pretty serious, that they have a specific plan. And you can say to them, like, you know, can we, can I help you figure out a way to prevent this from happening? You know, if there is a firearm in the home, which firearms are the leading cause of death with suicide. Um, maybe you could talk with that person about removing that from their home for the period of time until they're able to get into get some mental health treatment and decrease the, the severity and frequency of those suicidal thoughts. So you can have those conversations with them. You could try to help them. But obviously, this is a, a lot for one person, especially somebody who may not have mental health training. So the next step would really be to help get them connected. So connect them with those crisis resources, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline or the Crisis Text Line um, to get them talking with somebody who's trained in doing a more thorough assessment and um, safety planning and then or helping them get into a mental health professional. And then lastly, making sure that if you've had a conversation about this with somebody or if you have some concerns that you follow up with them so that it's not just one conversation that you just kind of let drop and, and leave it there, that you follow up with them again, you know, whether that's in an hour, if they're, if you're that concerned about them, or in a day or a week, just kind of continuing that follow up. There's research that suggests that that can really help with suicide prevention as well, if somebody is kind of regularly following up and checking in with a person. 
Oh, I love that. That is such a good point. One thing that you brought up that I love is the open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. Because when you assume that you know how people are feeling, when you assume you know the answers of why they're suffering or what's making them have these thoughts, I think you really take some value out of the conversation for both of you. I Mm -hmm. think the more information you can get, the better. And for them to feel heard, you know, you yeah. may have no idea why they're actually suffering. You may think you know, but you don't know what someone's going through at all. Mm-hmm. And then I love what you said about like helping them get help because it's actually really hard to get help. Um, the hotlines are great, but just from personal experience for helping people do this in my profession yeah. is that there are websites to get to to find a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but to get into a lot mm-hmm. of them for an appointment is tough and it's taxing on you or to find like, what is the right treatment option? So like you said, help people through that process because they're exhausted, they're mm-hmm. suffering and to have someone hold your hand to actually get the help you need is important. Like you can stay on mm-hmm. the line with them on the hotline. You can go to the appointment with them. You can make the calls that are hard for them to make when they're suffering. You can really do a lot of the work for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think to asking them, are you okay if I help you through this? There's a few things Mm -hmm. I have in mind that I could do for you. Like, are you okay with that? And I think them giving you the consent is kind of like, also, we're in this together. Like, you're not alone in this suffering. And how powerful it is to just simply know that you're not doing it alone because when you in, when you are in such a dark place, you feel so alone. And I, I think it's important to note too, that it's scary to have these conversations. No one likes talking about this because it's scary and it's scary to be direct and to ask these questions, but it's scarier Mm -hmm. to not have the person that you care for around. Right. And like you said, Britt, the, the numbers are climbing. It's a problem. We got to get over it. You, you are going to know someone that's going to do this, or I'm sure people know, or have heard of someone that's Mm -hmm. done this before. And so these conversations, I'm so glad you're walking through how to do this because it's dark. It's ugly. Like I said, it's not fun, Yeah, but But it's it's important. And it's not about you, right? I think that takes away the scariness of it's not about me and getting out of your own head And a lot of times we don't like talking about it and we build this narrative in our head about how wrong it could go and to just stop overthinking it and just simply ask because you care and how you would want someone else to handle it if it was you, I think is important to note too. And and to think about when, when you do have someone who's struggling, don't make it about you, make it about them. Mm -hmm. That's a great reminder. (laughs) Because you're in your feelings and you're nervous and you're scared and you don't want to lose them. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's not about you. It's about making them comfortable enough to open up to you. Yeah. I think that is such a great point. And that brings me back to one point I forgot to make in that you don't have to know everything. I mean, nobody knows exactly how to have these conversations or what to say or what not to say and what to do to support another person. And one way to make that a little bit easier is to simply ask that open-ended question of the person that you care about to say, you know, how can I support you? Or how would you like to be supported at this point in time? And then it gives that person the chance to say, you know, I need you to be here with me, or I just like that you're checking in with me, or I need some space, or, you know, whatever it is that that person needs, then they can kind of think about that and tell you, and they may not know either, you know, especially if a person is in a really dark place or really so depressed that they have little motivation and can't really even think clearly to be able to say that. But a lot of times people do know how they would like to be supported and they don't get asked that question. People are well-meaning and they want to help, but they may not always support a person in the way that that person wants to be supported. So just asking that question can be really helpful. So, yeah. I think that's a great point. Brooke, you said it really well. It's not about you. Mm -hmm. I like to think too about being the person that's struggling. So I think sometimes we, you know, we think about, oh, someone else is so in such a worse spot than me, or they're, they're struggling way more than me. My, my issues are so small, but I think it's important to kind of talk through how do you know if you're depressed or how do you know if you're anxious? Like what's the difference between having some like 
anxiety provoking thoughts versus like without going into a psychologist, you know, what are some of those ways that you can kind of hone into what exactly is going on with me? I feel a little off. Like, is there, do you have any tips on how people can kind of explore what they're feeling when they feel a little off? Yeah. Um, I think it's important to remember that, you know, as humans, emotions are normal. All of the emotions that we experience are normal. It's not normal to be happy all of the time, even though a lot of us would, you know, are aiming for that, but that's just not how we are as people. Um, it's normal to feel sadness. It's normal to feel worried or anxious or scared or angry. It's normal to feel all of the spectrum of emotions. And so that's a great question, you know, what may be normal or typical for me versus when should I be thinking about, you know, stepping up my self-care or seeking out uh, mental health evaluation. So in terms of how I think about this as a psychologist, really, we think about, you know, symptoms that are distressing to a person and or significantly interfering with their everyday functioning. So if your sadness or your anger or your anxiety is to the point where it is really upsetting to you, you're thinking about it a lot, it's causing you a lot of distress on a daily basis for a long period of time. And when I say long period of time, it's usually, you know, um, a couple of weeks or longer. That may be the indication that you need to go in and talk with a mental health professional and have an evaluation done. Or if it's interfering with your daily functioning, kind of like we talked about earlier, like if it's getting in the way of your relationships with people, if it's causing problems in your relationships, not able to kind of get stuff done in your everyday life, like it becomes difficult to make a grocery list and go grocery shopping, or you're, you know, the laundry has piled up and you have no motivation to do it. You don't have clean clothes anymore. I mean, sometimes that happens for all of us, but if it's really impacting your ability to get things done on a daily basis that is typical for you, then it's time to, to seek professional help. So for seeking professional help, you know, whether you've never done it before or you're afraid it might be too expensive, do you have any tips for people kind of how to start that process? Yeah, it can be really daunting. And like Andrea, you were talking about earlier how you've gone through this and helping other people kind of get connected with help. And it there are a lot of barriers to getting connected with a mental health professional or kind of navigating that system. And those are real barriers. I mean, that's a problem with our healthcare system here in America. And only about half of people who meet criteria for a mental health diagnosis actually get treatment for it. So it is really a problem and um, it can be really challenging to navigate. So, I mean, of course, you always think about starting with your like insurance provider, right? Call the number on the back of your card and that's one place to start. But so many people are not insured or are underinsured or, you know, mental health coverage is not necessarily something that's covered well through their insurance plan. And so there are clinics that you can connect with that are, you know, free or reduced cost or they operate on a sliding fee scale. So kind of dependent on how much money you make, then they would set their fee based on that. So that's one way to try to access services if you're struggling to do that. The other thing that's becoming much more common now is, you know, mental health apps. So if you're not able to, you know, go in and seek treatment with a mental health professional, there are some really good apps out there for mental health. Now, there are a ton of apps available for mental health that are actually not supported by good evidence, good research. It's really important that when you do seek out a mental health app that you do find ones that are research-based and actually have evidence behind them. So they're going to work. If you're going to use them, they're actually using techniques and tools that are shown to be effective. And there is a great website that kind of helps people go through those mental health apps and identifies the ones that have good evidence. And so we'll send or we'll have the link to that website as well in uh, the details for this podcast episode. So that's another way to address your mental health without actually having to, you know, go in for therapy with a, a provider. And it can be uh, more practical for people who are um, struggling financially or who just don't have the means or the time or resources to be able to do that at any certain point in time. Of course, self-education, I think, also is another 
way to go about this. So self-help books from the library, you know, listening to free podcasts like this that talk about health topics. Those are all things that are going to be helpful. And I, I always think about um, having your, you know, your mental health toolbox available to you. So there's never really one thing that works for everybody. You guys talk about this a lot with other health things too. It's like you have to have a bunch of different tools in your toolbox that you utilize. And what is in my toolbox is going to be different than what's in Andrea's toolbox or what's in Brooke's toolbox. And what works for me today may not work tomorrow. And so that's why it's so important to have lots of different tools. And when I say tools, I mean different coping skills, different techniques, different things that you can do that make you feel better, that you can utilize on a daily basis to address your mental health. I love that point. And I think what it comes down to, too, is knowing who you are and what you need. Because a lot of time we don't know. And once you kind of do that exploration of, okay, what makes me me? What fills up my cup and actually works? Because I'm seeing all over the internet that, oh, this girl's doing this. But is that really going to make me happy? Is that going to help me? So to find out exactly what you're saying, Britt, is what are these things that are truly going to work for me? And it takes time to discover them. It's not an overnight process. It's this never-ending journey. Mm -hmm. But I think even just taking the steps to learn is powerful in itself. And, you know, when I get overwhelmed, I have to take a step back and say, okay, but I'm doing something about it. Mm -hmm. Like giving Mm -hmm. myself credit for the intention that I have and letting that be enough in the moment is something that I'm learning is really helping. Yeah. Well, I love what you're saying. You're tuning into yourself and I want everybody listening to think about yourself and where you're at. We are all struggle. It doesn't matter what kind of privilege you grew up with or zero privilege. Like we all struggle with Mm -hmm. mental health. And so whether it's you're in this deep, dark place and you feel like you're suicidal or you're preventing this, like you're, Mm -hmm. you're in a great place right now, but that doesn't mean that that's not going to happen to you at some point or you won't be struggling. And so I think it's this constant ever, evolving process of, you know, who am I and what do I need right now? Is there something I'm struggling with? And what would my plan be if I started to struggle or I see my friends struggling? Mm -hmm. How would I cope with those emotions and really putting yourself in other people's shoes? Because it's going to happen to you. There's going to be struggles and you've got to think about how you get out of it Mm -hmm. and having different strategies too, like you said. And being honest with yourself, right? Like it's okay to not be okay. I think if there's like one thing I've learned in life that's been the greatest lesson is that it's okay to not be okay. What's not okay is to not do anything about it. Right. Britt, do you, I know we, you touched on stigma at the beginning of this episode and I just think that word, it just goes hand in hand with mental health awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, you see that and you're like, oh man, like, what are we going to talk about within this? And who does that even mean? You know? And Mm -hmm. so can you just speak to that (laughs) stigma? People are like, I don't need help. Or, you know, they they struggle to admit that they need help? It is ever-present, it feels like, the stigma around mental health. And it's perpetuated throughout media. And I don't know where it came from or why it's hanging out, but it's definitely still present. And it can be a real barrier for people, you know, to even think about their own mental health, to um, acknowledge that they they may be struggling or acknowledge that, you know, some of the problems that they're experiencing in life may be related to, you know, how they're thinking or feeling or acting. I think it's getting better as we talk about mental health more. To me, the way that I think about mental health is it's just like physical health. I really, I think, shifted in the way that I think about mental health throughout my career. And the way that I think about it now is it is just an aspect of your overall health. So you have your physical health, your bodily health, you have your dental health, you have your mental health. Like this is just part of who you are as a whole person. And it's really important to think about that. You know, just like you would brush your teeth and floss your teeth to take care of your dental health, you should be thinking about what are you doing on a daily basis to take care of your mental health. You know, are you doing um, meditation? Are you taking time to do some deep breathing at the beginning of your day or when you start to feel overwhelmed? Are you doing affirmations? Are you noticing when you, 
get into that negative place and you're starting to have these cognitive distortions in terms of like, like, you know, always putting yourself down, you know, having that inner critic or that voice inside of your own head that's putting yourself down all of the time. Can you notice that and challenge that and say, hey, oh, I'm doing that again. That's not true. And here's why, you know, I am a good person. This is what I'm doing on a daily basis that is worth helping me work towards my goals. You know, what are the things that you're doing on a daily basis to um, take care of your mental health, to prevent it from developing problems or to improve it if it if it's not doing so great? I like the idea of challenging it. Something that I've been doing is asking myself, is this true? Like when I have these anxious thoughts, right, is bringing it back to what is true? Okay. Because it is hard in those moments when everything is like going crazy and it's hard to take a deep breath and to be back in the present moment. I think awareness is key. And would I let somebody else talk to me like this? Would my best friend talk to me like this? Would my best friend allow me to say these things to myself? No, Britt would smack me upside the head. She'd be like, don't talk that big. You've got to, you've got to start tuning into those recycled thoughts. Like I noticed that I was doing it the other day where I was like thinking about this conflict over and over, like not even a new thought about it. And like, what am I doing? I'm mm-hmm. wasting the space in my brain and my thoughts, which could be something that brings joy or is doing something for someone else. Instead, I'm thinking of this negative conflict and nothing to do anything about it. And I think sometimes when you notice it, you've just got to pause and just intentionally think of what can I do that's a little bit kinder to myself? Yeah. What could I say to myself that it's just, or just drop it, like drop that thought. I had this moment the other day where same thing, I was beating myself up and it was over the s- simplest, stupidest thing. And I'm like, out loud, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this is how I'm talking to myself. But I also get in, in these points where I can't help it. So Britt, I'm curious, what do you recommend to people who are having these ruminating thoughts and they can't snap out of it. Maybe just some, some quick ways to challenge yourself or simple things you can say to bring yourself to the present moment and really get into what is true. Knock it off. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, I think when you said like people who may be having these thoughts, everyone has these Mm -hmm. types of thoughts and to different degrees, but this is just something that our brains do. And when, when it becomes a problem, it's because it, we're getting stuck, right? That's what rumination is. We get stuck on this, this one little thing and we keep turning our wheels on it, but we're not really problem solving. It's just making us feel terrible. Um, that's what rumination is. And so one strategy that we teach in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is one of the um, treatment approaches that is most effective for treating depression and anxiety is to, you know, identify that, that thought that keeps happening, right? To first notice it, to be aware of it, and then to challenge it. So to basically say, like, is this true? Brooke, that's a great thing to ask yourself. And one thing, you know, I will do in, in when I'm doing therapy with people is I'll write out that thought, whatever it may be, and then create basically um, a column of like, this is the evidence for that thought, and this is the evidence against that thought. So if you really actually break it down, like I am a terrible person is the thought, right? So let's write all the reasons why I am a terrible person, like the actual things, the, the, the facts that support that thought, and then all of the facts that go against that thought. And if you kind of do that simple process pretty quickly, you'll see that, you know, there's so much more evidence against that like negative thought um, towards yourself. And that's one little trick that you can do whether that's actually writing it out. Sometimes it's powerful to write something out like that and just see it on paper. Or if it's just something that you do in your own mind on a daily basis, it can be really helpful. And I think the more, to your point, that you identify it and act on it, you're lessening its power over you. Like yes. I like I made that switch of, like I don't want to talk about it because of the confirmation bias and what you tell yourself, right? You keep going. And I'm like, well, if I say it, and I think about it, and I act on it, identify it, become aware, I'm getting it out of me. It's the same thing with, like, journaling. It's this therapeutic, like, it's in my, I'm getting it out of my brain on the piece of paper, and I'm just, like, letting it go. But the difference Mm -hmm. is with a therapist is that they can, they can look at that journal, and they can be like, let's back this brain (laughs) up, because, yes, these are your thoughts. It is great to get them out. Not saying you shouldn't journal, but I'm saying is that, 
the the value of a therapist, I can't even put it in words. I, I know it's not going to come out as eloquent as I would like it to, but they are game changers. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they don't even have to say much. A lot of times I go into a therapy session. And I'm like, things are pretty good. I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. I end up crying my eyes out or laughing or talking about something I didn't even plan on talking about. And it is such a release. Mm -hmm. It's just like you said with journaling, but you have a professional who's trained in this shit. That's like, <laughs> they're, cha well, they're challenging you. Yes. And they're exactly what you're saying, Brett. They're asking you, is that true? Wait, okay, let's actually take a deep dive into this. And I think it's having just someone to listen to. But if you have had a bad experience, I also want to say, especially children that have had like divorced parents, I had a terrible experience a few different times as a child. I, a, I applaud my parents for trying to have a counselor, but the ones that we had were so bad and it stopped me for yeah. years from seeking out a therapist. And so I just want to encourage people to try it. And if someone is not a good fit, there shop around a million more. Yeah. And if you need suggestions in the twin cities, yeah. whew, I got some good ones. <laughs> so does Brett. I, think, um, I wanted to touch on that too, uh, just in terms of like seeking out professional help, a couple of things to think about. Um, is trying to find somebody who does an evidence-based approach. So an evidence-based approach is basically a combination of a couple things. So one, utilizing treatments that work. So treatments that have been um, researched, that have shown to be effective for treating the particular problem that you may be going into therapy for. So utilizing those effective treatments. The second thing that's really important is to make sure that if you're going into therapy, that you have goals for therapy. So what do you want to accomplish? Do you want to um, decrease your depression symptoms? Do you want to have better um, control over your anxiety or be able to relax better? Do you just want to be able to process some of the traumatic things that have happened to you in the past? Have some ideas about what you really want to accomplish during those therapy sessions and talk with your therapist about that. If your therapist is not asking you about your goals or is not setting goals with you, that is a conversation that has to happen. It really needs to happen. Because otherwise you could sit in therapy for years and nothing could change. And um, you could just keep paying for those sessions without actually having anything happen. And then there should just be like an ongoing monitoring process too. So if you've gone to therapy and you're into like your third session or your sixth session or your 12th session, whatever, you should kind of be checking in with your therapist to be like, hey, like, let's talk about my progress here. You know, when I first came in, this is where I was at. Now, where am I at? You know, and you should both have something to say about that. You know, your therapist should be able to give you some feedback about the progress that they've seen. You should be able to, to notice that. And if there hasn't been progress, then that's a chance too to talk with your therapist about like, what's not going so great? Is it something like, the, does the treatment modality need to be changed up? Do you as the, the patient need to be working a little bit harder, doing more of your homework? Uh, does the therapist need to be working a little bit harder? Or maybe it's time to change therapist too, because if there's not a good fit there, like if, if you're not feeling it with that therapist, you don't feel like you trust them, you don't feel like a good rapport with them, it's not going to work great for you. So definitely switch it up. That makes total sense. We do that as coaches in our company. Like you can switch up coaches if you're feeling like, you know, I might not be getting as much out of this as I'd like, mm -hmm. we will switch it up. Sometimes it's just good to get a different person's opinion too. So I love that. And I, I've been wondering that too. Like I have one for a marriage and one for myself and they close it differently. One gives homework, one doesn't. And I'm like, oh, okay. Is it because this is just what she does? Is she trained differently? I don't know. I didn't really look at what the difference in their letters behind their name were. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And that can be a question you bring up too. It's just, even noticing that, like, hey, I know you don't give me homework. Like, can you talk to me about what your approach is? Or, I mean, if that's important to you, if it's working and you're liking the way it is, then just leave it alone. Yeah. Yeah. My therapist will ask me, what do you need? Like, what do you want to get out of today's session? Oh, God. And it's kind of like coaching in the sense of, like, I'm in control. Like, she's not telling me what to do. I'm exploring this and she's asking me the right questions mm -hmm. to get me to what I need. But it's funny because a lot of times I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I said that question is a lot. It gets question. you thinking. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, wow, well, let me tell you. No, but a lot of things. Where yeah. do you want to start? But it, it's it just it helps you get specific on what you need yeah. and to really tune into that because a lot of the times we're taking care of everyone else that we don't even know what we need. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think if there's anything we've learned in the last year is that 
mental health is so important. And in every way, shape, or form, someone is dealing with the effects of COVID. So it's obviously a hot topic right now, and I would love to hear your take on it. Yeah, so obviously with COVID, the priorities for our country and the world were to save lives, right? So things shut down, people were told to stay home, to socially distance, um, which was the original way it was framed, and now it's transitioned to physically distance because it can be so hard on people to socially distance from people. And we're now beginning to see the effects of the changes that we've made in our nation and our world on mental health um, because what has been absolutely essential for our physical health uh, of the entire population um, has not necessarily been good for our mental health. So there have been so many stressors with COVID. I mean, initially the anxiety regarding the virus and worrying about, you know, if you're going to get it or if your loved ones are going to get it and what that's going to mean or how that's going to impact them. Job loss or reduction in hours. And then, of course, that leading to financial insecurity or instability. The social isolation piece is huge. Not being able to see friends or family, um, not being able to just do things out in public, you know, like I talked about earlier, sometimes it can feel good just to go to sit in a cafe and um, have a cup of coffee and be around other people, even if you don't talk to them. And so all of that was kind of taken away and has had a really big impact. Not to mention just the other side of things for a lot of parents who may be working from home and trying to take care of their children while they're working from home. Their kids may be doing virtual school. And then uh, there was also initially, you know, a lot of daycare closures. So there was a lot of stress around that for parents in particular. So there's been just a ton of stressors. And there was a recent survey done by the American Psychological Survey about, you know, stress related to COVID. And generally what that turned out is that most Americans feel like their mental health has suffered in the past year. Everybody is reporting increased stress. There's also other side effects of this of these changes that we made in terms of there's a, a large percentage of people are reporting increased weight gain, unwanted weight gain over the past year, an average of 29 pounds, which I thought, thought was pretty significant. Problems with sleeping, you know, people having a lot of insomnia related to whatever, whether it be anxiety or just the lack of structure and schedule in their everyday life. If they're home all the time, there's not that structure and that can really have an impact on sleep. And I guess the general takeaway is just that the past year has been really hard for everybody. It's been heartbreaking for people who have had losses and really difficult for people just getting by in their their everyday life. And so if you have been struggling in the past year, I just want you to know that you're not alone, that this has been really hard for everybody, and that a lot of people mental health has really taken a hit because of the changes that have occurred in the past year. And so it's really important that you engage in those self-care habits and if needed, you know, seek out professional help. The other thing that came out of this study and that has been somewhat surprising is that the generation that has been hardest hit by COVID in terms of stress and mental health is Gen Z. So that's people ages 18 to 25, that they're reporting the greatest increase in stress And they also have the greatest prevalence of like mental health disorders and they're least likely to seek out mental health treatment. So for that age group, if you think about it, and Brooke, you can probably speak to this in terms of your own experience, but just graduating from high school or starting college or graduating from college, just that uncertainty about like, what does the future hold Mm -hmm. when with a global pandemic happening and the economic, I guess, consequences of that social isolation when you may be a single person who's living alone or who doesn't have a partner or who may not have kids or whatever, that social isolation and and being told to not um, connect with people is really, really hard for that generation. Yeah. And I think it's just acknowledging that it's okay to be upset. You know, I think a lot of times my friends and I will talk about it and a lot of us aren't high risk and we are struggling with not being able to go out and see our friends and enjoy this time of our life where we don't have kids yet and we, you know, I wouldn't say don't have responsibilities, but as someone who's older and has kids, different responsibilities and it's being, it was stripped away from us. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about how like the best time of our lives, it's 
not ruined, but it, it sucks. Just putting it direct, it sucks. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the getting in your head about, okay, like it could be so much worse. Like there are bi- people dealing with other issues, but just to acknowledge it and be like, it sucks. And it's okay to think that it sucks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and when is it going to be over? Yeah. I'm sure. Like I can't even imagine. And people, like you said, that are single, mm-hmm. that want a partner and they're stuck at home and yeah there's dating apps maybe it's a good way to meet someone over the phone sure Mm -hmm. but like it's not the same you want to go out on a date with people and for a whole year plus yeah it's gotten taken away I I think about single young single or maybe not even young anybody that's single looking for a partner really I just I I just feel for you well hopefully Things are going back <laughs> to some sort of normalcy. It, we're getting there. Yeah, We're getting there. You know, we could talk about this topic all day long, and it's something that we're really passionate about and clearly for a, a good reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just want to make sure that everyone knows whether you are really, really struggling or you're just listening and you are thinking, you know what, I could use some improvement in this category There's always something that you can do. There are so many free resources out there that we will link in the show notes for you, Um, but also all of our channels and all the tips that we are giving you guys for free on our social media. You can find us at Gold Ivy Health Co. on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and our blog. We have everything linked in our blog right on our website, goldivyhealthco.com. And if you're looking for some ideas on self-care, we have a incredible episode, episode seven, featuring Sonia Eklund, where she gives amazing, amazing resources and tips. So check that out. Yes. And before we jump into our three gold stars from Britt, Britt, we just want to thank you for being here. Your insight is so powerful and you're such just like a calming, for me, you're just a calming person, but I feel like you will be for everybody else. (laughs) But the way that you speak about mental health, I hope that it gives people that calm that I get from you Mm -hmm. where this is common. We all struggle with it. We all need resources at some point in our life. And I hope when people listen to this episode that they really think about self-care. They really think about what am I saying to myself? How do I care for my mental health? How will I care for it as I change and evolve or life happens? And so I just want to thank you for your time. And I want to thank you for all of your tips and insight today. Well, thank you guys for having me, for giving me the opportunity to come on and talk about something that I care about so deeply and for getting to be a guest on one of my favorite podcasts. (laughs) And I just want to thank Andrea for um, bringing Britt into my life. Yeah. So thank you both. She's just the best. Yeah. You're just the best. (laughs) All right, Britt, now it's time for our three gold stars. All right. So three gold stars. One is to develop healthy daily habits. So coming back to those basics of sleep, nutrition, and exercise. So make sure you're focusing on those things to take care of your physical health and your mental health. Two, schedule pleasant activities. So whatever it is that you enjoy, whatever brings you joy, whatever brings you happiness, whatever makes you have fun, try to schedule that into your day. Aim for at least one activity each day that will allow you the opportunity to experience some pleasant emotions and aim for even more than that if you can, through, sprinkle it up throughout the day. Plan it specifically, um, be specific. So set the time when you're gonna do it, say what you're gonna do, how long you're gonna do it and with whom, and then check yourself. So monitor you know, how that is impacting your mood when you do that and make sure you are doing it on a daily basis. And three, um, don't hesitate to talk with your healthcare provider about mental health concerns. So this is really important. And it doesn't have to be a mental health provider. Talk to your primary care physician about it. A lot of primary care offices now have behavioral health consultants available on their team. Request a a consult with that behavioral health consultant so you can talk with them about it. Or ask for a referral to a mental health provider to help you get connected. All right. Now it's time for Unleashing Ivy. Are you ready, Britt? I'm ready. Okay. What's one way to center yourself to help strengthen your mental well-being? Deep breathing. So I do this multiple times per day. I start my day with deep breathing. I end my day with deep breathing. And anytime I am feeling overwhelmed, I come back to my breath and practice that deep breathing and mindfulness. I love it. I read or I was listening to a podcast and 
it was a psychiatrist. She was on it and she said breathing exercises, right? And she gave a specific one of inhale for three, exhale for seven. And the science behind that is it pushes blood and oxygen to your frontal cortex. And I was like, oh, so I've been trying it in for three, out for seven. And I like it. So when Britt says deep breathing, that's what I think of. So if you hear deep breathing and you're like, what does that mean? Tell me in for three, out for seven. Try it. Love that. Next question. When you're really struggling with your mental health, what's one thing you do to help get you out of a dark place? Talk to someone, anybody. Usually I call Andrea, but honestly, talk to, talk to anyone about it. Just getting it out can be really, really helpful. And you are not a burden. No. All right. Last question. What's one thing you wish you would have known sooner? I wish I would have known sooner that mental health is a daily habit. That it's something that you should be practicing on the daily in order to maintain mental health and to prevent it from becoming a problem. I think about it more so, like I said earlier, about brushing my teeth. I do that twice a day on a daily basis to take care of my dental health. I really think about mental health in that same way now. Like I meditate every single day and that is my my daily brushing of my teeth. It's my daily way of keeping my mind healthy. All right. And as always, we'd like to leave you with our piece of gold. So Britt, this is a quote that speaks to you. So would you like to do the honors? Sure. So this is by one of the women that I really look up to, Dolly Parton. And she says, we cannot direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails. This is Gold Ivy signing off. Listen to your truth and go chase your gold.